Well, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for putting together this wonderful program. Uh, good to hear you, Frank. Uh, thank you to Matthew Kraus, Rick Bishop, and everyone else who's involved with this wonderful organization. So my talk uh, today, I thought about in a 25 minute window, what would be the best thing to talk about? And I think the one thing all great coaches, physicians, doctors, chiros, trainers, strength and conditioning specialists that, that everyone struggles with is how to prioritize information. So there's this old adage in uh, professional baseball, especially in the treatment of MLB players and teams, is that uh, we always wanna stay in our lane, which, which I do agree. However, you also wanna know what those other lanes look like. Therefore, therefore we don't get into an accident, literally. So um, staying in your lane, but also understanding when we might need to use the other lanes to most effectively treat our athletes. So my experience has been the best physicians in the world, they, uh, they always are able to gather information and with that information, be able to make uh, the best decision at the right time. Uh, it's not just in the world of treatment of athletes, it's also in business, it's in athletics, it's in all walks of life. So uh, my talk today is gonna uh, basically highlight those key points. So Things Don't Matter Equally, this is a book, uh, the one thing that I've, I've really kind of grown to love which basically explains and exposes the importance of being able to find out of like in our assessment, what is the most important thing starting to work there. And then we can have the greatest effect on all things by being on that key link. And I had one of my great mentors was a guy named Dr. Levitt. He was a neurologist who's now deceased. But anyways, his big tenant was to be sure that through our assessment, we always find what the, the key link is. And what's hard about that is the key link could be a nutritional thing. It could be a strength and conditioning thing. It could be a manual therapy thing. It could be a rehabilitation thing, a biomechanical thing in baseball. So we don't always, uh, we don't always get to, to wear the cape or be the hero. So being able to determine through our assessment what is the most effective treatment for the athlete uh, is really the gold standard in, in treating uh, not just baseball athletes, but all athletes. This is an example for prioritization. So if we looked at a really, really good emergency room, then we could see if you showed up there today with chest pain, one of the first things that the person has to do who's attending the attending physician in ER that day is determine, are you having a heart attack? Could it be a trigger point from your pectoralis major, maybe joint blockage in your mid thoracic spine that could be referring pain uh, in that area? Or for example, do you have acid, acid reflux or do you maybe have something else? So real quickly here in this example, you can see how important it is to be able to prioritize this information because in the ER setting, it can mean a life or death situation. Now, in our world, let's just say that we're talking about an MLB training room, it may not mean uh, life or death, but it can definitely drastically change our results if we're able to implement the right treatment at the right time. And again, this is the missing link, in my opinion, in um, a lot of professional uh, training rooms is being able to prioritize all the data that's coming in. There is certainly no shortage of data that is, that is out there. So uh, again, I, I think the, the best coaches, athletes, and PTs, chiros in the world, what they're able to do they're like a detective. They're gathering all this information. And once they've gathered all this information, then from there, uh, they'll make a, hopefully a good decision. Uh, or maybe they, maybe they realize, you know, down the road, maybe a day or, or two from uh, now that they need to basically call an audible and then they need to change what they're doing uh, to, get a, to get a better outcome would be another thing to add on to that. So you can see here, in emergent medicine, it becomes really, really critical that we're able to triage the patient. And actually, one of my good buddies is uh, he's in charge of all the emergency rooms here in, uh, in St. Louis for uh, the Mercy Hospital system. And he says something really fascinating that'll, that'll probably blow your mind. He says, whether or not you live, like maybe you got in a car accident, whether or not you survive is completely reliant on who the attending physician is that night. Mercy here in St. Louis is one of the best in the country statistically uh, in uh, emergent medicine. However, even saying that, he said that it is, it is that important. So that is basically what I'm going to talk about today also, which is your ability to critically think 
situational IQ, how to make a really good decision when we're gathering all the information. And also decisions aren't always so binary. That's what makes them a hard decision. So being able to make a really good decision when the pressure's on and when we have a lot of data in front of us, and uh, that, is, that is absolutely vital. So even if we are looking at, uh, let's just say we're looking at a picture and let's just say that we don't like their mechanics. So one thing that I would recommend, you know, and this is already being done with all the teams, but you know, if you show up in spring training, we're looking at a hundred pitchers. The first thing to do is keep it really, really simple and say, from a biomechanical standpoint, who's at high risk, who's at low risk and who's at no risk. And we can simply bucket from the beginning there. And the reason I think that is so important is because we are going to treat the high risk biomechanically flawed athlete differently. They may not know it, but what we're going to be doing, that's going to change how we're rehabilitating the athlete. It could change how we're strength and conditioning the athlete. It could definitely change what we're doing from a nutritional functional medicine standpoint. So being able to know this, you can quickly see how uh, complex some of these decisions can be and how involved they are with, with literally every member of the team. So then we, we, of course, don't always have a wonderful outcome, as we all know. So when things don't go the way that we want them to, one thing to, to get good at is being able to do what I would call an autopsy on the spot, which basically means, uh, you know, if someone has gotten injured or there's uh, something hasn't gone the way that we want, we immediately take a step back and we just review the case and we basically, you know, ask ourselves, okay, what could we have done differently? Therefore, there's really no bad things in, in the treatment of these athletes or working in an MLB training room. There's only learning moments that uh, we can all learn from and we can grow. And I think sometimes with the lack of uh, a grand round system where everybody's meeting, talking about all the current injuries or just about all the players in general, if we're not doing that, it becomes really, really difficult to know uh, who's in control of the whole situation and to make sure that we have all the right treatment modalities in place. So once somebody gets injured, I, I love this idea of just calling it an autopsy as we, as we look back and we try to find out if we could have done any, anything differently. And a lot of times that doesn't mean anybody did anything wrong. It's just basically an accountability piece. So in, in my world, which is a little bit more on the treatment side of things, we have what we would call a functional triage. So this may or may not mean anything to the people that are watching this, but these are the, the different techniques that we work on. And if I'm working with a bunch of people that are working with the baseball athlete from a treatment standpoint, it's, it's very critical that we understand how to apply these things at the right time. It's actually less important that we know how to do all of these things that you're looking at, and arguably more important that we know how to prioritize each one of these techniques to know when to use the hammer at the right time, uh, when to, you know, two weeks from now, maybe we're gonna start strengthening, but early on, we might do more manual therapy. We may dry needle today, cause an inflammatory response. Therefore, the next 24 hours, we'd expect the athlete to be a little bit sore. As you can see, all of this needs to be timed out. And depending on which team, you're working with, you're working with a team, there's different people that might be in charge of this. This could be the head ATC. This could be, uh, you know, just depending on whoever the head is, your department is, but somebody needs to be making the right decisions for these athletes. I think after working with uh, uh, a lot of the MLB teams, I think one of the things that you see a lot is you see the athletes uh, or the inmates kind of running the asylum where basically they come into the training room and they order up their services a la carte so at the end of the day, the player maybe, you know, has had a massage, maybe they've been manipulated, they've had dry needling, they've already, uh, they've worked out, they've done BP, and what ends up happening, no one's watching this, so what ends up happening is a lot of times they get completely overtreated. So in my opinion, it becomes really, really important that we have one person who's kind of in charge overlooking this uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen, because I think that is, uh, that's kind of an epidemic problem, quite honestly. Okay, so how do we get good at this skill is the next question you're probably uh, wanting, to, wanting to ask. And uh, this is all given to us by really, really good assessment. So this is a picture from Jeff Caitlin. Uh, in just about every presentation I've ever given, I have uh, this slide. And uh, this is basically, uh, depending on what you see when you look at this, either you see this old witch looking uh, figure or you see kind of the beautiful brunette who's kind of peering over her right shoulder. And what Jeffrey Maitland says about this picture is 
we all see the same picture, but see something differently. And that is, that becomes really tough because in the world of, you know, treating baseball athletes and the same baseball athletes, each one of us are looking at the same player and we're seeing something completely different. So again, um, we need to gather all the information from our assessment, and then we have to start prioritizing what we need to work on today, tomorrow, next week, uh, next month, next quarter, and then even like within the next year. And uh, I think this is, uh, and when the players understand that's what you're doing, it's actually very liberating for the people who are implementing the care because they don't necessarily feel the pressure of having to do things in the next 24 hours, which of course in baseball we have to do, but also we also have some uh, longer term goals that are also really important. So it always helps of course, when we can put numbers to show the player or even show the staff what it is exactly we're working on. A great quote from the uh, economist uh, Dimming, in God we trust all others must bring data. So whenever we can put data to things, even a simple, uh, something as simple as a range of motion, uh, obviously in strength conditioning, we have all kinds of data points that we can look for, but uh, not being obsessed with data, but then also using data as a motivating factor and something that we're shooting for. So, and again, to be good at this, there's gotta be a plan involved. And I would say this is uh, another real common mistake that, that I see uh, in training rooms, uh, not just MLB, but also collegiate, where we basically do not have a plan of getting to our goals that we have that we have with each of our players. So uh, a great quote from Abraham Lincoln, if I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I would spend six hours sharpening my ax. Basically what Abraham Lincoln is saying here is we need to have a plan. So in, if we have the right tools to do the tasks that we're trying to do, it's going to go a whole lot better. My experience has been that a lot of people are, they have these lofty goals, but they don't have the plan mapped out on how to get there. And if we don't have the plan mapped out, that means that if things don't go the way that we want, then we can't change the plan as we move along. So if, it, if a task doesn't have a goal, this means that there is uh, no point in starting it in the first place. So we, we have to have that even for an accountability piece. So, and also a lot of times, this is basically, if we're talking about the injured baseball player, it's even like outside of the pain syndrome that they might be having. I always use the example from Moramar Mosley, who's the expert in the world in the pain sciences. If a shark was to take off your arm or leg right now, you would literally feel zero pain for three hours. If I were to paper cut your finger right now, it would drive you nuts over the next three hours. So I'm always very, very careful in the clinical setting of walking into the treatment room and solely asking the patient, how is your pain today? Because as you can see from this example with uh, the shark uh, amputee example, that you know pain is a very subjective, unique experience, that there is a lot of things involved. And I'll tell you, I could tell you some crazy stories about uh, MLB players, about um, them saying they have an injury when they actually don't just because of baseball re reasons and things their agent is telling them. So whenever we can get back to function is actually a very liberating moment, especially in the world of uh, Major League Baseball. So painful things are not the enemy, but the signal announcing that it's time to change, improve the heel and to embrace life, a little bit cheesy, but Mike has in this book, he talks about the importance of taking any injury that you're working with, with an, with an athlete and literally making that a catalyst to be able to change something. So if you were to tear your UCL today, let's say you're having uh, Tommy John next week, then, you know, we have a day where we're like, this sucks. I mean, you know, we didn't expect this. Um, all your dreams right now are uh, threatened to be ripped away. So, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this injury and we're going to make this injury. It's actually going to make you the best pitcher in the world. So we're going to, we're going to take this injury. We're going to bring something good about it. Starting tomorrow, when you show up here, we are going to, we're going to start the process to getting you back to being best in the world at, at what you're doing. And when you frame it like that, it is so refreshing to the athlete because the athlete has probably been with the ortho their families telling them their career's over. You can be there to, to be the voice of reason and tell them um, how you're going to do it. And most importantly, you're going to give them a pathway. And what I would tell to the, the players coming back from UCL is we have 13 months. And in that 13 months, I want to see a positive slope of improvement. We're going to have good days. We're going to have bad days. But when it's all said and done in 13 months from now, you're going to be a better pitcher than you were even before your UCL injury. And I think this is, I do this all the time 
I even do this with people who have autoimmune diseases. If you get diagnosed with multiple sclerosis today, I would have the same conversation with you, but it's just a really refreshing way to look at uh, injuries. And uh, my experience is the players really grab. So what are the audits? You know, if we're, if we're working with uh, someone who maybe does have some symptoms or maybe not, but uh, I always, the first thing I'm going to do when I walk in is I'm going to check the mechanics. So I don't necessarily mean the biomechanics of throwing or pitching or hitting, for example, but the mechanics of how the joints are moving, what the soft tissues feel like, what they look like from a functional movement standpoint. Um, I might ask them a functional question. I might ask them, you know, if you weren't sleeping before, were you able to sleep on your shoulder last night? Uh, or, you know, depending on the analogy. And then as you notice, the third and final thing I ask them is about their symptoms. Because really what I want the player to understand is what I'm good at and what most of these people who are listening to this are good at is we are good at changing function, all right? So uh, Western medicine does a great job with the pain. The orthos have all kinds of opportunities to give our patients prednisone, cortisone. Um, you know, we can, we can take oral medication. We can do a lot of things to help us with our symptoms. But um, what you and I are really good at is, is changing function. And we want to be really clear to the athlete, uh, this being the baseball athlete, on how important that is. So in my world, that being, you know, kind of a chiropractor, physical therapist, uh, our audits are joint play, how the joints are moving. What do the soft tissues feel like? Are there trigger points in the muscles? Is there excessive tension and tone? Um, what do their functional tests look like? And we always do a really thorough neuro neurologic examination. So this is basically what I come back to every visit and even after a visit. So I can tell them how the player is doing today. That's also another liberating moment as a, a practitioner uh, or a coach or trainer is we actually let them know how they're doing today. So and that's a little bit different than what people are used to, where we're so reliant on the player telling us things. It is just an amazing feeling when we can go through our, through our testing to tell the player how they're doing today. And one thing that's going to shock you is if you do a good job of doing this, the player is basically, even if they came in and they're kind of bitching about, you know, whatever they're bitching about that day, and you were able to show them that actually from a functional standpoint, they're better watch them change their tune. It's really, it's really kind of interesting to watch because how a, how a player would report their pain could be that they, you know, maybe they had too much to drink last night. Maybe they had a fight with their spouse. Uh, maybe they just have other life stress. Maybe they had a hard night with their kids, whatever it might be, but that could potentially reflect how they're reporting their, their pain today. So so another really important thing for uh, great clinicians is what I would call situ situational IQ. Uh, we usually think about this like with our great athletes. So everybody knows the, uh, the Wayne Gretzky stories, the Michael Jordan, Tom Brady. What made these athletes so good is basically situational IQ. And I, we'll start with Wayne Gretzky. So Wayne Gretzky shows up to Edmonton. He's 18 years old. He can bench 135 pounds one time. So, and if we looked at, all of the things that just tell us whether or not someone's a good raw athlete or not. So let's just say 10 yard dash, 40 yard dash, vertical, broad jump, some plyometric testing. We would see Wayne Gretzky was not a very athletic athlete. Wayne Gretzky went on to rewrite every record that, that exists basically in hockey with scoring assists and things like that. And they're, they're the safest record in sports. So how did Wayne Gretzky do it? He did a lot of other things really, really well. One of them is situational IQ. Wayne Gretzky did not go where the puck was. He always went to where the puck was going to be. And that is, uh, that is basically being able to read your teammates, being able to read the situation. Um, obviously, everybody knows the amazing Michael uh, Jordan stories. And Tom Brady, uh, whether you like him or not, he is just, in my opinion, he is this literally the best at situational IQ. So uh, we always talk about athletes, but actually you and I have the opportunity to also use situational IQ. And it's not always what we're doing from a treatment standpoint. It's what we're doing, what we're saying with our words, um, reviewing the whole situation, um, all these outlying thoughts and ideas. And once we've gathered all the information in the current situation, being able to make a good decision, way easier said than done. You know, a lot of times the, the chiropractors, BTs, you know, they'll, they'll want to know how to get better at this. You know, in certain ways, this is an intangible, but in other ways, I do think there is ways to, uh, to get better at this skill. And one of them is just literally being there in the moment, present time consciousness, and then being able to, uh, to audit your patients. So however that might be in whatever world you're in. So 
uh, I always kind of uh, also talk about, if you look at the American school system, it's all based upon rote memorization. If I ask you what, what is seven times seven, you tell me it's 49, not because you're doing it some complex math issue, only because you actually um, memorized a multiplication chart at some point in your life. We do not, to be good clinicians and coaches and trainers and PTs, et cetera, what we want you to be good at is actually not memorization. What we want you to be good at is critical thinking and reasoning. So you can read here, there's been, there's actually been, you know, some pretty decent research on what makes for good critical thinking and reasoning. Probably be no surprise to anybody listening to this, but being able to analyze and assess information issues, situations, problems, perspectives, and thinking processes. So we have to be able to take in the data. And then once we've taken in the data to be able to make the best decision, it's almost like throughout our day, especially with the baseball player, you're basically gambling, which means you've seen it this way a million times. So therefore, you know how to handle this, or maybe we haven't, and we got to make uh, do something different. Uh, I also love the story of Bobby Fischer. Bobby Fischer was considered to be the best chess player of all time. And in his memoirs, what he talked about was the reason I was the best chess player in the world is because throughout my day, I was building, building what he called memory traces. So what does he mean by that? He basically means from the age of five on, every time that he was playing an opponent, he knew what their next move was going to be. He knew their, their move five plays from now. And he kept paying attention to what their future moves were. And what it led to or culminated with was basically they thought uh, Bobby Fischer was cheating. All his opponents at the time were like, I don't know what this dude's doing, but he must be doing something illegal because there's no way he knows my next move. And what Bobby Fischer said was, all this time, I was basically building memory traces. You and I, throughout our day, we have a chance to be building memory traces. So basically what we're doing is we're learning how to recognize patterns. Nobody really does this, even at the highest level. So what, is, uh, what happens a lot of times is basically you just, you know, we stay stagnant. And if we can talk ourselves into present time consciousness and really learning through every encounter with the player, then at the end of every day, you should be exponentially better at your craft than when you got there that morning. And you can only do that by what we're, what we're talking about now, which is pattern recognition. So that is why you do need to get into a habit of systematically gathering your information. Uh, that way we're able to be able to recognize when things look a little bit different. And I always say like in the clinical world, if something just doesn't feel right, that is, uh, that is basically clinical intuition. That's no special skill. What that is, is clinical intuition is clinical recognition, meaning you've seen it a million times and because you're good at pattern recognition, now this looks a little bit different. Therefore, we can, uh, we can make a good, uh, we can order more testing. We can get another opinion on it. But uh, this is what makes for the best clinicians in the world is basically being to, to have that kind of hunch in your belly that something's not uh, not going the way that we want and being able to do that. When you're a young clinician, that's impossible to do. But as you start to get more experience, you're able to get way better at the skill for what it's worth, the best doctors in the world are able to do this. So obviously we need systems. There's no denying that. And in the 1920s and 30s, there was tons of aviation uh, uh, catastrophic uh, crashes basically. What they found out was they basically were able to decrease these drastically by making the pilots go through a systematic uh, review of systems. So, and you know, plenty of movies in the past have kind of made fun of this, but I think all of us, especially as we're learning, we would be very well served to do to uh, do the uh, gather the data very systematically in the same way each time. Um, and then from there, we can start to, you know, call an audible and change some things or you've earned the right to take a shortcut. However, in the beginning, you have to have systems and routines. Therefore, when you're gathering your information, you're able to pick out that outlier piece of information that we may need to, to do something with. Now, the other thing is being able to leave smaller, uh, non-ideal things aside. That's, a, again, we're back to uh, prioritizing information. We can find a million things wrong with all of our players, even our best players who are in the best shape, 
So, you know, what actually needs to be worked on today and what, what really doesn't. And we, we want to be careful that we don't get lost in the stuff that actually uh, doesn't matter. Uh, from a movement standpoint, I, I think, uh, especially if you're young, Greg Cook, uh, his system, the SFMA or, or even the FMS, that's a good starting point. Do I think it's perfect? Of course, I do not think it's perfect. But I think it's Greg Cook has made more people in the world look globally than anyone else, meaning uh, not mattering where their pain syndrome is, like looking at the whole body just to see if there's uh, problems throughout the kinetic chain. Uh, Ken Kaufman, I uh, heard him speak earlier did a great job. And he also was talking about the importance of truly buying into a kinetic chain. If you're young and you don't have the ability to, and these hunches that we're talking about, I think, you know, a system like this can be very, very effective or wh whatever you've been trained in or whatever you like, but we want to be sure that it's making you look globally. That's probably the most important point. So, and then you've earned the right to take a shortcut. Then we got to watch out that uh, the system isn't hampering you. So if not careful, we become locked into seeing every problem in the exact same way. And I think that's where, especially if we're working with a team with other people, getting other opinions can be really healthy and fruitful because therefore, if we're missing something, then someone else can be there to kind of, to fill that void. Uh, and also just like within yourself, you know, like sometimes, you know, we'll do a deep dive into a technique system. And then, you know, we, you know, we learn something else about another system and how we're going to plug and play that. And I think that that's what the best, uh, uh, strength and conditioning people, trainers, and uh, et cetera, are able to do. Uh, and Jeffrey Maitland also, so Jeffrey Maitland was a physical therapist, and uh, he basically has written multiple textbooks on rehabilitation and manipulation. And uh, basically, he talks about this. He says, we want to be very systematic, especially in the beginning, but we also need to be careful because we will, we will severely limit ourselves or box ourselves in if we don't think about some other ideas. Sometimes you need to think, uh, not only inside the box, but also outside the box. So uh, this will just be a quick review. I just, uh, what I wanna talk about, cause I know Ken already kind of reviewed this is, you have to buy into the concept of a closed kinematic system with the human body. And what that actually means is that you have a way to assess and treat all these key links of the body. And this could be from a manipulation standpoint, uh, a rehabilitation standpoint, a strength and conditioning standpoint, a nutritional standpoint. But I always tell the story about Dizzy Dean. Um, Dizzy Dean was, a, of course, a, a, a St. Louis Cardinal pitcher. It was 1937. It was the All-Star game. And he takes a ground ball off his first metatarsal failing field joint uh, or basically his big toe. So he basically loses the ability to dorsiflex his great toe. So he can't dorsiflex his great toe. And as the story goes, and of course, we didn't have MRIs or CT scans back in the 1930s, but ever since he, he hurt his toe, he never could get his arm back in the, uh, in the same slot, he said. And he's got majestic mechanics. So he's in my top 10 as far as just like overall fluidity of mechanics and uh, did a lot of things well. So it was the all-star game and he really didn't want to play, uh, but the pressure of the St. Louis media and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch basically forced him to play. So uh, anyways, that toe injury, and he went to his grave saying this, the toe injury is what led to him destroying his shoulder. And what I think this is a testament to, this is a testament to how important the closed kinematic uh, system is to function of the body. So you and I have to be 100% bought into this irrespective of the pain. So no matter where the athlete is complaining of the pain, we want to do a really, really amazing job at assessing every one of these key links and being able to determine what is the, what is the link I need to start on to get the greatest effect on the whole system. Uh, and it's you know a very complex system, of course. So joints moving well affect how well we're utilizing the muscles and vice versa. So uh, you know, it's so easy to kind of divide up, you know, joints from muscles and things like that. But at the end of the day, they're all, they're all related and connected together in the kinetic chain. Now, the idea is called regional interdependence. If this thought is new to anybody who's listening to this, the best paper out there is by Suki, Cleland, and Wainer. And basically, there's 20 different uh, uh, good pieces of research in there to basically explain why we need to be looking at the whole kinematic system and not just the area where the athlete might be hurting. That'll probably be a review to everyone who's listening to this, but worth, worth reminding you, of course.
well, how do we know we're good at this? It's kind of hard to know because there's really, it's not like a basketball game where we have a scoreboard in the side of the treatment room or the gym, kind of letting us know how good we're doing as a clinician. So I always kind of flip the switch a little bit. And I make people think about uh, some baseball stats. So those of you who are familiar with the war stat, which will be everyone, which is basically wins above replacement. So in the world of players, it's basically usually won by uh, Mike Trout. So it basically means if you are unable to play in the game tonight, and we replace you with a triple A player or, or someone else who would be considered to be average at that level. Uh, what is the difference or how much are you costing your team? And again, Mike Trout wins this. So said differently, when Mike Trout is out of the lineup, he's costing his team the most compared to any other player in major league baseball. So if we flip the switch to the strength conditioning specialist or coach or the, the PT, the Cairo the ATC, whoever the example might be, if you weren't able to go to work today and someone else was to replace you, what would that look like? So that, that lets you know like how much value you're adding to your treatment, the treatment of the, of the baseball athlete. It's just a really good way to kind of like see if people are performing at a world-class level by making them think of it uh, that way. Because usually you're only thinking about the player, you're not thinking about the people who are treating the players so again, if you didn't show up today, what would be the what would be the the cost? And this is really humbling. I always say this to the older clinicians. It's kind of uh, sad to think about, but what if actually the team would be better without you there? And then that's uh, that's always uh, a bad thought, but anyways, a motivating thought. So in review, I just think that you know what makes for you know good decisions, and that's kind of been the theme of my talk today, as far as uh, the treatment of the athlete and. Because we usually think about like major things that people F up basically. But what really happens usually, I mean, that will happen, but usually what, the, what happens is we have um, these little micro or mini uh, mistakes that get made throughout the day that basically accumulate and become bigger problems. So how do we make good decisions? And this is from David Butler's book. Uh, hard to believe this is 22 years old, but uh, he was the first person in the world to talk about what I'm about to talk about right now which is basically the wise action triangle. So we have the best of science, which you know we've already heard a lot today already from some wonderful experts in the world uh, on this uh, discussion. Uh, we have the best of current therapies. So you know training techniques, manual therapy, rehabilitation, whatever's the latest and greatest in that world. And the thing that's never talked about, but I don't have words to describe how important this is, is uh, the one-on-one -on -one relationship you have with the player. And so if you made me say like, what is like, what are the two things that make, make that up? I would say um, one would be certainty and never confuse certainty with cockiness. So, but we, we want to be sure that we, you know, the athlete knows that what we're talking about. And of course that is you having confidence in what we're doing. And the second thing would be enthusiasm and not in the annoying cheesy way, but enthusiasm to me means in the clinical setting, it means that the patient or the player can feel that you would rather be with them there today than doing anything else. And that is, uh, that is a, a really, really good feeling when you're the player, you're the patient, and you know somebody is looking out for all these different things. I used to say when I was with the Cardinals, if these players ever knew everything that I was paying attention to, they would, they would probably be impressed. But uh, uh, because basically we have a huge responsibility to the player and all the different things that we can be doing to, uh, to help them. And whether they realize it or admit it or not, they are Ferraris. So our job is to make sure that they're performing like a Ferrari. Uh, in saying all that, I know I'm getting close to being out of time. I want to, uh, again, just thank uh, the person I've been dealing with is uh, Matthew Krause, who I've uh, heard a lot about. So uh, finally got to talk to him this week and, uh, and Rick Bishop, of course. And, uh, and Frank, uh, thank you for uh, coordinating all this. Uh, if you need to get a hold of me, BW at Wins Fine and Sports, a great way to get a hold of me. I'm uh, of the older generation, so uh, Facebook Messenger is a good place to get me. Um, and also, we have a podcast where we uh, interview all the best people in the world in manual therapy and rehabilitation, and that is the Gestalt Education Podcast. So in saying all that, thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, and I hope to see you soon.